cut. So today's topic is innovation and insurance. Uh, normally, the CIP Society uh, presents webinars uh, using GoToWebinar. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a different uh, presentation style for us. We thought that uh, <laughs> the topic of innovation warranted a more innovative presentation. So we are trying this video stream. Uh, and uh, as I say, our partners, uh, the Insurance Institute is partnering with uh, Kinetic Studios today uh, to present this uh, because it is quite a setup with all of the cameras and the lights and all. Uh, so really pleased to be here, really pleased to present in this way, and really pleased with the panelists we have. Uh, so if we have most of our attendees online or signing on, then we will begin. So my name is Margaret Parent. I am the director of the professionals division at the Insurance Institute of Canada. Uh, normally we've been presenting uh, webinars uh, called our Advantage Live webinar series for our graduate members. This presentation is a special free presentation that we are doing as part of our National Education Month that the Institute has been running all month. Really excited to be able to offer this topic uh, free to our members and to present it in this way, as I say. I'm really pleased with the panelists we have today. Uh, we were quite excited in planning this discussion on innovation and insurance to obviously invite those who are at the forefront of it. So today we have Mark Lipman, Lipman, CEO, COO of AIG. Thank you for the motion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk with Lynn I'm sorry. Chief Operating Officer of AIG and has responsibilities for AIG's innovative strategy within Canada. So doing some really great stuff with AIG. Uh, Andrew Lowe, who is President and CEO of Kinetics, not only enabling us to be here today, but certainly has been at the forefront of bringing insurance and technology together for 25 years or more, so has a lot to say on that. So we're really excited to have Andrew with us. And then lots of conversation about innovation has been about the um, innovation spaces, the digital garages. Isn't it really interesting how insurance is really cottoned on to these kinds of really innovative things that seems more like the world of Google and not normally the world of insurance. Uh, so we are really pleased to have Chris Mermetz with us. He is the co-founder and CEO of Logic3 Group, and in particular, the Cookhouse Lab, which is really trying to do innovative things within the insurance space and make insurance better from a technology point of view. So um, personally, I don't think we could have had a better panel. Uh, hopefully, you'll say that at the end as well. And uh, so format of the presentation is each of our uh, presenters are going to uh, speak for about 10 minutes, give us a context, and then we are going to open it up and I'm going to pose questions myself to get us started. And then as well, we're going to invite uh, you attendees to type into the chat box any questions that you have for our panelists, okay? So a little bit of uh, formal presentation, but also fireside chat. So. Without further ado, and do really hear from the experts, Mark, would you please take it away? Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining us uh, in, in this format. It's great. A little nervous to be live on camera, so um, indulge me a bit. But as Margaret said, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for AIG in Canada. i um, held or worked with AIG for over 11 years now, over 20 years in financial services. So I'm um, you know, a bit of experience in the area. Um, one of the things that I get to do at AIG that is great is, is to lead our innovation efforts in Canada. Um, that has been approximately a three-year journey now. Uh, and, and, you know, um, it, it's a fun job. It, it's, it, it's a job I benefit from, from the, the global infrastructure that AIG has, right? It, it is a large multinational insurance conglomerate. It has a, a pretty robust global innovation effort and initiative, for the most part grounded out of San Francisco in the innovation lab there, um, but, but stretches around the globe. And, and really what, and you mentioned Lynn Oldfield, our, our CEO and I talked about about three years ago when we started on this journey was really how to bring more of the innovation to Canada directly for the benefit of our Canadian clients and, and to engage with our Canadian staff directly. Right? And, and, and how can we go about doing that? Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things, let me jump ahead a little bit more for me, Don. Thank you. So, 
you know, I, I guess the first thing I want to address and, and perhaps say is, you know, I, I think it's a myth that that the insurance industry is lacking in innovation. I, I think that actually we can do a pretty good job of it. Um, I think we have a rich history of innovation within insurance. And, and just to sort of demonstrate my point, um, in my spare time I put together this 5,000 year history of innovation within insurance. Um, and, and you know, I mean, I, I just put it up there for the purpose simply of demonstrating that um, there are a lot of clever and innovative thinking people in insurance. It's been that way since really the beginning of, of merchant trade. Uh, you know, everyone knows the story of Lloyd's and how um, insurance began there. In, in the late 1600s, and uh, in the coffee houses, um, you know, you can see examples of how modern commerce played into innovation. You can see um, close to 1900 how the insurance industry responded to a new little in um, invention called an automobile and designed automobile insurance for that. And, and you know, really, um, because I work at AIG and notwithstanding, I'm not supposed to make shameless plugs, AIG has had its role in innovation, um, you know, launching the first cyber product, but you don't really see um, external parties, non-insurance parties participating in innovation in industry until the mid 2000s, right? And then Google had its, its aggregator website, um, more recently, you know, examples, companies like Lemonade and Trove and all of those get a lot of headlines. But, but within the core of the insurance industry, there is a fair bit of innovation that's always been going on, I think always will be. Um, and, you know, and that's about internal driven innovation. And, and that's, you know, what one of the things I'm really excited about and that we try and foster uh, within Canada at AIG. So, so how do we go about that? How, how, do, you, how do you do that? And, and I think there's two key ingredients. Um, you know, first and foremost, you need some engaged employees who, who are interested in that, right? And, and the second thing you need is to build the right kind of framework. Um, you know, and, and so I was thinking about how to illustrate that. Um, thought of an old movie, I don't know if anyone will recognize this, but this is an old Kevin Costner movie. Um, and you know, um, what's the feel the dream? Thank you, feel the dreams. I know that I almost forgot. And and they had a great line in it, right? That I mean, if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably heard the line if you build it, they will come. And, and I feel a lot about that about innovation, um, and internal driven innovation and in insurance. If you build the right environment, if you give your people uh, a safe and the right kind of framework to innovate in, then, then they will always surprise you. They will always go way beyond your expectations. So um, I just wanted you know, to see who has seen that movie and who's a Kevin Costner fan. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, thank you. If you build it, they will come. So, so what is the right kind of environment? What, what do you have to do to get that innovative juice flowing in um, in your teams and your colleagues. And, and of course, there's, there's endless ways to do that. I, I can give you some examples from what we've done at AIG. Um, one of the best programs that we've used to drive internal innovation within AIG is what we call our innovation boot camps. And these are a series of competitions. Um, we've run them all over the world, whether it's by product line, by functions, any kind of business group can host something like this in AIG. What we essentially do is bring together 20, 25 of um, our top performers. We put them into teams of five and six, and we assign to each team an executive coach. And the coach will provide direction and guidance, but what the coach particularly has to do is be the conduit or access point for the team to all the resources that AIG has as a global organization, right? And so there's a commitment throughout the organization that when a team comes knocking and they're an innovation bootcamp team, we want to give them some time and attention and, and hear them out. And the teams have about three months typically to, to germinate an idea, some kind of innovative, whether it's a product, a process, um, something driven towards our brokers, to our clients, even internally. But they're gonna come up with something that doesn't yet exist at AIG that we think is gonna make a positive difference on our business. They present those ideas to a panel of judges, global executives from AIG. And, and while there is a winner, um, the goal really 
the seal of approval is, is to get the authorization to proceed, to proceed from, from business case or, or proof of concept right through to fruition, whatever that looks like. Um, and, and so, you know, one thing that I did here in Canada to make sure that internal innovation was alive and thriving was to host a boot camp specific just to Canada, where only Canadian you know, Canadian um, employees could participate. And we had five teams. All, I'm, I'm very pleased that all five teams got the authority to keep on moving, right? So um, I think it speaks to the fact, again, that when you empower your employees, the, the quality of the ideas they come up with is really, it never disappoints. Uh, and, and so other ways to foster internal innovation, well, you know, so when we started, we hadn't done this kind of thing in Canada previously, um, wanted to kind of reach out and find out what was available, uh, you know, find out what we didn't know in a sense. And, and so that's where Chris came in. Chris and Cookhouse Lab have been fantastic partners to AIG in, in terms of our our internal innovation journey. I'll, I'll let Chris talk about you know the secret sauce that is the Cookhouse Lab. But you know the idea of um, collaborative innovation and, and co-creation. It, it was a great way to learn to get our feet wet to begin with. Um, we participated. We have participated in a number of. Of projects and programs there. Um, one was blockchain, and you know that was our first foray into working with Cookhouse. Um, and it's a project, and you know, the results that came from that, which was really you know a list of use cases for blockchain within insurance, that continues to get a lot of traction, a lot of attention within AIG globally, right? And so um, it's 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 a resource that doesn't have to be replicated every time AIG thinks about how to. Uh, approach blockchain and, and where to deploy resources, right? Because that, that roadmap is done for them now. So that's really useful. Um, we kind of went from there once we felt like we had our feet underneath us. We started using the Cookhouse for AIG specific innovative pro, uh, programs and projects. We did what we call the design a thon around a particular line of business to really reimagine and re engineer the process to try and improve the experience for our clients and the brokers that we deal with. And, and you know, that too was um, a, a tremendous success that we were really happy with. So I won't take up, I think, too much more time than that, except to say, you know, uh, I and, and AIG are absolute advocates of, of employee-driven innovation. I think um, it, it just makes so much sense and it's such a shame to underutilize that resource. I don't think anyone knows our business and insurance better than our employees. I think they have, it, it's a, an enormous wealth of untapped energy and creativity when you give them the environment to to safely create and ideate uh, it drives engagement and, and engagement in turn drives more innovation so it, it's a fantastic sort of cyclical process that that you can cultivate and it takes on a life of itself um, and really you know so the sky you know we just see it going um on and on, I'm very pleased with the outcome and, and you know, big plans throughout the rest of 2018 and beyond for internal innovation. Nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Boilerplate there? Boilerplate. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, there we go. Maybe that forward-looking statement. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so then why don't we uh, move on to the next speaker, which is Andrew Lee. Okay, so then why don't we have Andrew then start to talk about uh, consumer and how the consumer is driving uh, this innovation as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. We we're really happy to be working with um, the Insurance Institute uh, on this on this project and this uh, live stream. I'm really yes. excited. So uh, I agree with Mark um, around the field of dreams concept and uh, you know, build it, they will come, but. I know you mean that building a great, you know, user experience and meeting, you know, building great stuff that you know meets the expectation of your customers Absolutely. as a big part of it. Um, and what we do at Kinetics is actually about you know connecting insurance companies to their customers or insurance providers to their customers. And we do that by you know when you build it and they will come. We brag about that. <laughs> we help we brag about that, and then we keep bragging as a user, uh, user technology or your service. To make sure they become uh, you know, revenue generating and ultimately sales. But I'm here actually to talk about 
uh, behind the wheel of disruption. I'm here to talk about disruption. And when I talk about disruption, I mean, well, lots of things are changing around the world in terms of technology, how we use technology. It's impacting everything we do. And so what's happening uh, with insurance is that, well, these technologies and how we use them and how we engage with them is changing the way we're doing business. So that's, that's what I mean by disruption. And this man here is the 21st century disruptor. And um, most people don't talk about Elon Musk in this way, but he was the founder of PayPal. Remember? So without PayPal, we would not have you know, got the uh, online payments and Apple Pay, Google Pay now. You know, he kind of you know, led that thinking. And now he's launching rockets and Teslas into space. Um, and who knows where that Tesla is orbiting around the sun somewhere. Uh, and there's a lot of you know, pictures and memes about it. But he is truly a disruptor, right? No one would ever thought that you could launch a rocket and vertically land somewhere in the middle of an ocean on a drone ship uh, safely and then use that rocket again, right? So that's that's disruption. So he says this, I could either watch watch it happen or be part of it. And that's what I want to talk to all of you today is that, well, you need to know what is happening. Uh, and then I want to show you how you can learn to be part of it. Now, it starts with understanding and there are forces changing the future of business today. And I'll talk about some of those forces. How we use technology is also an important part of this. And putting the two together, I'm hoping you guys can figure out along with me is how do we create those, um, you know, build a great thing and they will come because they will absolutely delight your customers, right? I'm not just talking about consumer, I'm talking about any customer, uh, internal customer, external business customer, or a consumer, this all applies to. So there are actually six forces changing the future of business, but I'm only going to be able to talk to two of these today. Um, on March 29th, I'm also doing another um, seminar with Insurance Institute. Uh, for those of you in Toronto or the Ajax area, I'm going to be at the Ajax Convention Center that day, and it's actually worth one technical hour on Rebo at the Rebo Credit. So uh, please attend. So I'm only going to talk about two of these, but there's actually six. But the, these two are actually the most important ones, and that is hyperconnectivity and slingshotting. Now, they may be um, slingshotting, maybe new, new words. So be patient. I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But hyperconnectivity. We're all hyperconnected, right? When we wake up in the morning, we worry about the battery life on our phone. We worry about who's connecting, where's my Wi-Fi, etc. That is so important. But what's happening because of our connections is that there's a lot of data being collected, like tons and tons of data. So hold that thought for a minute because I want to actually take us back a little uh, into the history of the cell phone. And of course, it started with the 1G cell phone. Remember those brick phones we used to carry, right? That actually got people talking wirelessly. That was it, wireless talking. But the 2G converted that wireless talk into digital. So now you can hear each other. That's why Verizon had those commercials, can you hear me now? Because they went digital. And digital um, you know, allows the computer to actually smooth out that signal so that it's a lot clearer. Well, in 3G, now you can get your emails on your phone with the release of the iPhone for the first time. And now we're using 4G. For those of you watching this live stream on, on, uh, on their phones right now, or on their computers, or more importantly on their phones, that 4G network is enabling the live stream. So without 4G technology that's on our phones today, we could not do this live stream with anyone. So that's important. But what is being developed now in hopes of being launched you know, later this year in a little bit and then into 2020 is the 5G network. So the old network is about connecting people. When I'm on video live stream, I'm connecting with you people. But now 5G is going to allow us to connect people and things together. I'm talking about the Internet of Things. That's why you see the concept of Internet of Things really exploding. 5G can accommodate a lot more bandwidth, a lot more data. Um, it's going to give you uh, gigabytes. Uh, of bandwidth. And imagine downloading a high definition movie, let's say Guardians of the Galaxy, in like less than five seconds. That's how fast 5G is. Today it still takes 20 minutes on your fastest uh, uh, net network at home. Okay, so imagine in, in three seconds. So that's, that's, uh, that's very important. But what's, what's going to happen with the 5G network is that it's really going to fire up the utilization of Internet of Things, and it's really going to bring to life artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence does not work without a lot of data, right? So you have to think about artificial intelligence. Today, we deploy developers, and developers make software for us. Um, they make software in a finite area. We give them requirements, right? And then they build to the requirements, right? But artificial intelligence means that it can build its own software. Right? That's what it really means. It learns from the data 
and then changes its programming on its own in order to um, you know, do work for us that we can't process with our own human brains. So that's why the data and the connectivity is so important to the future of everything, including insurance. So the prediction is this. By 2020, there will be 50 billion IoT devices around the world, five connected gadgets for every user. I'm already way beyond that. I've, I've got 26. <laughs> I've got 26 uh, connected devices. Um, and I've got you know, you know, 10 connected devices in every household, five billion internet users. As of right now, check this morning, we're at uh, about 3.8 billion users uh, on the internet. And then that's 500 devices with unique digital IDs for every square meter um, of land. So that's a lot, right? That's all collecting, that's all collecting data for, for us to use with IoT and artificial intelligence. So what do, why do I care about this? Well, our customers are gonna expect personalized products and services based on data, right? We live in a world that knows more about us than we do. That's what I mean. So a, a classic example of how we've done this in insurance already is telematics, right? Now it's telematics is, is still its infancy in Canada. Um, but it is collecting data in your driving behavior. And I believe most carriers, and uh, Mark can confirm our, you know, if they're using telematics or collecting data in order to, you know, feed some sort of analytics or an AI in order to determine uh, driving behavior and then do underwriting that is catered to the individual versus underwriting that is based on statistics, right? You know, uh, you know just because there's more accidents in a certain area, and I live there, but I have a clean driving record, should not mean I pay those those larger rates as an example so that's that that's the importance of connectivity and in our industry and uh having services based on data so keep that in mind as your teams innovate and hackathons and uh those data groups the second point i want to make is all about slingshotting and this may be a new word but this is what i mean by slingshotting so in the older days back in my computing days right i had to take computer classes right i was trained in university in computing um and there were books on dummies on computer, right? Today's, those are all gone. You know, you just pick up your phone or your iPad and you're instantly using it. Slingshotting means things are so easy to use. It does not require any learning or any ramp up to be able to, you know, be productive and make that device very valuable. That includes you. Yeah, that's But it also means like, like we could be like the five-year-olds who pick it up and just intuitively know. Yeah. Like all of us would be that intuitive. All of us, all of us, all of us, all of us. Um, and, and, but be, making simple to use uh, software, you know, devices, et cetera, is hard. It's very, very hard. Um, many, many, many years of uh, research, et cetera. Um, and using data and understanding the needs of the customer makes it all very easy, right? So, uh, but it is very hard to do. Now, the, 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 it's now simpler to use, the cost is a lot less. And in fact, you know, countries that don't have the infrastructure like we do, the wires that we do that connect our homes, et cetera, you know, are leaping, are slingshotting past the PC, uh, past the landline phone, all the way to uh, cellular and smart devices and computing in their hand because it's now affordable all around the world. Um, so keep that in mind and keep in mind in data. So I want to talk about now these two items actually driving what are the experiences our customers are going to expect, right? So UX means user experience, CX is client experience, um, and so is experience. So again, data. Data is becoming a resource, right? It is a resource like oil or gas. It is super valuable to data, right? And it's infinitely expandable and it's now exponentially growing. So imagine like all these millions of users on the internet and growing, smartphone users and growing, all collect data, that's infinite, right? And we can infinitely store this, but it's infinitely valuable as well because people are starting to recognize that data is a raw resource, like gold, and they're gonna mine it, mine it like gold. So, you know, new jobs in data science, data scientists, data analytics, you've all heard AI, it's all about mining the data, right? So we're gonna mine that, but, the key to mining the data is to figure out what the actionable insights are for the business, you know, insights to delight our customers, et cetera. So we gotta, we gotta learn from that. So at Connex too, right? Everything we do is always based on data. We never wanna make an assumption about how a customer wants to buy something. We always use the data to prove it. Um, so data is really, uh, you know, creating this whole new uh, industry in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now. This industry has already been, you know, started, you know, many years ago in the 50s, even before, um, but it's now really come to light because we actually finally have so much data that we can actually train machines and we have processes that are fast enough. In fact, 
today, most of the machine learning companies or the artificial intelligence companies that are starting up are using software to create machine learning algorithms. So there's software or self-learning. But these two guys I have on the screen here, which is the CEO of Intel and the CEO of NVIDIA, they're making hardware. Uh, to do machine learning. So hardware is going to run way faster than software. And their, their hardware is going to self-learn and create neurons, just like in our brain, on silicon, uh, dynamically to even further machine learning. So that's, that's, uh, that is what's happening in, in the world. And, um, and they're very serious, investing billions and billions into, into this research. So what does this mean then in terms of a user experience? Well, our customers are going to expect smart personalization, like give me the products that I need today, right? And, and being able to go online and figure out what those needs are. But it's not all about computers. I want to add one part is that humanization is also really important. Um, one of the companies I've worked with, uh, Pro Navigator, they make a chatbot that's an AI chatbot so I can go and ask questions about insurance and it responds. But they also have kept in mind that, you know, customers flow differently and always want to talk to a provider. They always want to be able to research first and talk to a provider. So, you know, human insurance providers are always going to be a necessity in this, but people are going to want, you know, more intelligent uh, kind of interactions and, and, uh, and conversations online. But there's always the human connection. Of course, there's this whole smart speaker thing that's happening right now, and that's all based on natural language processing or AI. And so, um, uh, you know, you can buy those Google Homes or Amazon Echoes for really cheap, and you can say, hey, Google, where's my car, et cetera. Um, and, but you know, what I found right now is with these devices, it's replacing the keyboard. I have not picked up my phone recently for a while to ask what the weather was. I just ask what the weather is. I don't go back into my weather app to find out what the forecast. So I'll say, hey, Google, what's my weather on Thursday? And then it'll tell me exactly, right? So, uh, you know, it's replacing the keyboard. So that's something to keep in mind at our customers. In fact, we've already built this for insurance coding. You can buy a Google Home from Best Buy and ask Kinetics for an insurance code, and it'll ask you the right questions and give it to you. You're not typing anything in. Um, the third one is designed for the age of immediacy. In an on-demand world where I can summon a car on demand, right? Um, and even like Tinder swipe on demand, right? Uh, you know, as an extreme, you know, uh, you know, your customers are going to want to do, be able to access you right away, anytime they want, right? And so, you know, this is always my calling for, you know, more purchase online uh, type of scenarios for us in Canada. Uh, we're a little bit behind on that front around purchasing online, but again, always the insur the human insurance provider will always will always matter. I talk to many folks and the bottom line is nice, but they always want to make sure like their coverages are correct and that they have the right product and so I always want to talk to someone over chat and then eventually potentially over call, right? Even with Google Home, we want to make sure when they get a quote, they can even, you know, use the Google Home to call someone, you know, if that, and that works. And the last one is, um, is, is virtual reality. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but um, it, it already exists in everything, in a lot of things we do, right? Anyone buying a late model car, you'll see your maps on your windshield, that's augmented reality. So that's the best use case. People are using drones to uh, fly over properties to assess damage and do claims, et cetera, and, and catastrophes. And they usually use augmented reality to, to uh, for the computer, the machine vision, to highlight data points in the, in the catastrophic area or the damaged property in order to show an adjuster. So they don't have to go out uh, in danger of things, and then they can issue claims faster. So in the end, what I'm talking about here, all this technology is, is going to enable a frictionless experience, and a lot of marketers talk about that omni-channel experience, right? Okay. But I think starting now, the omni-channel is going to expand beyond social media, digital marketing, email marketing. It's also going to include the smart speaker, your connected car, uh, your Nest, your Nest Protect, your Nest thermostat. So they're going to expect you know, our industry to use all of this as data points in order to provide products and services. And I want to engage in any one of these areas to do that. So, uh, so as part of slingshotting, people are going to expect no friction in purchase and service of anything. And a great experience will keep them retained a long, long time. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, I hope to see some of you at the March 29th where I debrief this whole thing in an hour with lots of demos and <laughs> more detail. Yeah. But thank you, but I like that frictionless experience. Sounds good. Okay, now over to Chris. Why don't you tell us about Codecon's lab? Sure. So again, it's just following up on what you've already heard from Mark and Andrew, but the reason we created Cocos is really a combination of all those things. We think insurance can absolutely be better. Um, but to Mark's first point is 
we think we as an industry can help drive what that better is. So I'm going to talk about co-creation. Um, Take that back to the logic three uh, group of companies. We, we've got a number here, but it's really Cookhouse Lab, which is the most recent, which we'll talk about now. Um, first, what, what happened was, and this was a, about a four year journey, but there's a, one of our other companies that we recently launched, uh, Leimashi, was called Apexa. And it's a compliance platform at its core, but the bigger, the bigger meaning that we got out of it is we spent four years working with five large insurance companies and four large MGAs to create something for them. So we weren't building a tool and trying to sell it to them. We were working with them to build what they wanted. And then they all worked together with us. So we're very deep, deep partnership. And we work with compliance teams and their, their legal teams and their operational teams. But really what we saw here is for the first time in my career, anyway, the insurance industry really does want to work together. So for big, sticky, kind of the BHAG type problems, the industry is ready to, ready to partner and co-create. So Paxa was a company, but it's really the beliefs that it gave us to get into cookouts. So very quickly, um, cookouts we created because we did see a lot of innovation happening. And yes, we thought we could drive it, but we were also worried that there, was a, there are a number of horror stories where a lot of money goes into an insure tech startup and it doesn't survive or you don't see a lot of tangible value coming out so we wanted to create something where the industry could move faster but also try to create value not just talk about creating value so it really is we do want to make insurance better but we want to do it from the perspective of helping people work together creating that framework where people can work together and deciding and creating not just products but business models because we think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do things better and there's a lot of people who want to do this again to, to mark's earlier point inside all of our companies, we have a lot of people that want to create things and a lot of great ideas. So we don't have to be disrupted by somebody in their basement. So very quickly for me, who is part of Cookhouse? Uh, it really is a co-location, co-creation space. So we wanted to make it all inclusive. I'll talk about uh, open IP in a moment, but we invite everybody to be part of projects with us. It doesn't matter if you're a, an agent, part of an MGA, insurance company, carrier, uh, other other vendor, we think getting a number of people together is, is, a, is the important part of success. And you'll see an entrepreneur in academia at the bottom. We think that's quite important as well because quite often, like insurance within the industry, we can we can solve a lot of these problems, but sometimes we lack that sense of urgency. So when you bring in somebody who's just started a company and they don't get paid if this doesn't work, there's an urgency that not everybody has, right? So that, that entrepreneurial urgency really is an important part of this formula. And I think academia has been very helpful for us as well. So um, Cookhouse is, is part of the Logic 3 group and another uh, partner company called MSG Global. And MSG is based in Munich. So across Logic 3 and MSG, we've been bringing students from local, uh, the Toronto Kitchener Waterloo University corridors. We bring students in from there. But equally important is we've been bringing students in from some of the German universities. Mm -hmm. And diversity is really important. So not just in terms of backgrounds, but ideas and beliefs and what people are used to seeing or not seeing. So academia is a big part of it, but we really like that global perspective as well. So we really try to encourage any project we work on, we do have a good rounded team of, of people trying to solve that problem. Talk about the problem in a second. So what you'll see here is on the right side of your screen, not screen, your screen, so there are a number of companies that have been working with us for the past year. And for some context, we only launched uh, Cookhouse maybe a year ago, February 1st last year. So we've just, we just yeah, tripped over a year. But by the number of companies you see on the right, we do believe that we're onto something. There's a, there's a need there that we think needs to be filled that we're, that we're proud to be doing. So the way the model works is we have this, uh, a unique recipe for innovation. So it's a, it's a lot of design thinking lean startup, but it really is going back to what both Andrew and uh, Mark said is, go back to the consumer. What does a consumer want? So any project we do, we spend a lot of time, the project team, talking to consumers. So our office is near a bunch of universities. So if that's the target audience, go wander around the, the campus and talk to people, ask them questions. So really iterate, but go to the ultimate consumer. So that's important. So that design thinking for an insurance project is, is what, we, what, we, what we really like. And then we have a collaboration model that works um, the, the co-creation model that I talked about. And, and when I say co-creation, it isn't just that we've got a number of companies working on a project. It really is a step further in that it's an open IP uh, project as well. So anybody who works on that project, any one of those companies on the right, after a project, after we create a minimum viable product, 
they all have equal rights to go and build something. So again, the belief there is a lot of smart people are in different companies. So let's get all those curious people about a problem on a project. And then whatever happens, happens. If four companies want to go up and do something and it's whoever's the best able to execute on that idea, we'll win, which is the way it should go. Equally, if nobody wants it, then maybe that one didn't work and we'll do another version of that project. So open IP we think is important for truly open source innovation, but equally is the co-creation element, getting a number of people from a diverse background to work on problems. IP being intellectual, intellectual property. Intellectual property. Fair so enough. Just correct. making sure everybody's got that. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So all the intellectual property is free and clear to be used by anybody who works on that project. Um, I'll go through this quickly. So every every project starts with somebody has a question. Everything starts with we have to have a question you want to ask, and then that that'll we'll, we'll kind of chew on that a little bit. That'll generate an idea. That idea will be what we focus on a project, and it will create an MVP. What the other thing is that we're very clear on is. You have MVP. minimum viable product. <laughs> intellectual. Product. Yeah, I think that I think that we're granted to I, I, all those things <laughs> like that. Our attendees might not know this lingo. There's talk, you know. I don't try to talk that as well. So the, the, the minimum viable product, they have to a project has to end. I've been insured for a long time, right? So I've I've been on committees where I'll travel the world to go to meetings and nothing really ever happens. <laughs> so what you gotta do is you got one week, one month, or one quarter, but this project has to end. And you go to the project team that worked on it, you have to present back to your peers and your companies. So that gives a little bit of pressure that it's not just that we're working on this ourselves and going to a cool space. We have to present back to our leaders and our peers leaders why what we've been doing for a month. And then that peer pressure is good. It keeps everybody focused. So getting to that minimum viable product is important. And after that, Again, we're trying to build this whole collaborative model in this partnership ecosystem where this is a really good idea and nobody wants to take it forward. Maybe there's a, a startup in Highline Data we've been working with them and there's an entrepreneur trying to solve that problem and go off and build a company. Or maybe AIG and a new uh, 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 an entrepreneur might want to go off and do it. So it's just making sure that we have that, that ecosystem in place so that we can, so ideas don't just die on the vine, so that we can actually create new products and new ideas. Uh, let's just give you a quick sense of that as a space and just give you a quick sense of some of the projects that we've worked on. And like I said, Cookhouse is only just over a year old. Um, but there's been a number of interesting, I'll, I'll show you some of the minimum viable products in a second. But we've done a number of projects, they range in, in time, but equally, what we found is everybody really likes the experience. And some of your staff have seen that, right, Mark? So it's not only is it you, you have fun working with a different group of people, but you're doing something outside of your normal day. So we found some of our customers use it in terms of just giving some of their, some of their team members access to a different environment. So very quickly, I want to two MVPs I'm going to talk about. And I actually Mark mentioned this one. So as we started Cocos, everybody was asking about blockchain. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what to do with blockchain. So what we said is, hey, we're getting the same question a lot. So MVP doesn't have to be a product. It could just be what Mark was saying earlier. What are the best three things we should do as an industry? So those companies along the bottom, they worked together for a month and they said, okay, we brought in a number of partner companies just to do presentations. You'll see Cryptiv, IBM, KPMG, G 3 They all come in to say, just to help educate our team to say, what is blockchain? So we get that base understanding. And the team worked for a month on, okay, these are all the problems in insurance. What should we point a technology like blockchain at? And what came out of that were three use cases. Um, one being a, uh, uh, a, travel, a travel insurance one. One was on a, um, on a, uh, a group, so, yeah, group coordination of benefits. So for group, in, group insurance, how companies can coordinate that experience. And the third one was around agent licensing. So, and each one of those use cases created another Cookhouse project. So it becomes a little bit per, 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 kind of self-perpetual and it, it keeps creating the next project, the next project. Um, this is another good example of one that uh, a company came to us and said, in the life insurance space, it's hard to get a life insurance attending physician statement from a doctor's office. So how do we make that better? How do we make that easier? How do we make that frictionless to your point, Andrew? Because there's a lot of friction in insurance. So this was a very cool project, 90 days, and they brought in a machine learning element to it, a gamification element, and they created this really neat um, app where you can you can digitize the the the, the, the doctor's uh, physician statement and create those digital connections to get it from the doctor to the insurance company, and this was done in 90 days. So it's really impressive the pace that they can move. So what you'll see is 
with a with focus, with a very clear kind of end date, and with people who are really passionate about a problem, you can do pretty cool things in a week or month recording. <laughs> That is the one of three group of companies and companies. So that was that was a speedy presentation on uh, <laughs> innovation in in, uh, in insurance. Uh, we have had uh, a couple of questions uh, come in from our audience, so I will refer to these first. Um, and so, in particular, um, there's a question around artificial intelligence. And it, it's making a movie reference, so this should be fun too. I don't know. I see that one. No, no, no this, is, this is the Terminator. So <laughs> it's a whole thing. It's a whole, right? Which is going to take over. So if, if AI can process faster than human brain and more logical, what is it to prevent AI from logically deducing that humans are viruses or not logical or destroying the planet and taking corrective measures? Anybody want to tackle that? <laughs> yeah, I don't have a simple answer for that, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, it is it is for the good, not the bad. It is for the good, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I talk, I've spoken to a number of AI companies, and that is top of mind, right? And you'll see some AI startups that have a core value uh, as part of the organization. As you know, we're using AI to do good <laughs> and to do preventive. Don't kill me. I'd be good enough to die. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, there's. I mean, that, there's a lot of debate, so I I, I can't say. I can't provide an opinion on that, but it's a little. So I think what's interesting, maybe, maybe just aside from the doomsday scenario, I yeah. think what is a really interesting debate, though, is, you know, can you teach AI moral values? And and and, yeah. and, and so you think about a real practical application, right? Um, if we're going to have autonomous self-driving cars, where that yeah. conversation right? comes to and, you know, it's the car finds itself in a situation where it's about to get into an accident, and does does it get into the accident and potentially hurt people in the car? Does it veer off that there's a pedestrian? Which is the lesser of the evil, right? And that car, that that software in the car, the 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 intelligence has to make those kind of decisions in a split second, and it's really people who are ultimately programming that. Um, so, so there is some really interesting moral debates around AI. I think at a, at, a, at a more practical level than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and actually, AIG did a great piece uh, yes. at the uh, CES this year, and I attended that, and they did a study, um, you know, about who is you know ultimately liable if machines are writing their own software. You know, and the cars drive themselves, and so on, and so yeah. And there's no, there's no answer at this time. People are doing heavy research, uh, heavy study on 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 how to think this through. So. Just to follow that up, I completely agree. That is an interesting part of the debate, and that's where coming back to Cook, because that's where we did an autonomous vehicle project. And there's a Stanford study that everybody had to do to come up with some of those moral guidelines. Would you, if if a pedestrian was crossing against the light, would you hurt the pedestrian or the driver? So. It, it, it is a really interesting debate, but equally, this is where industry standards become important because you, you really want to know that every car is going to behave the same way. <laughs> like one car is not going to take out the pedestrian, one car the driver. So it really is interesting that standardization isn't always what we're known to do well. But in some of these moral cases, we have to have kind of standard rules. So that came out of one part of it. That was one of the most interesting parts of it. Cool. Um, one of the other questions is about the slingshot idea. So super interesting, and we are behind making our website as user-friendly as possible. However, we're struggling to even get an easy quote tool on our website. It does not send you off to a third party. So as you said, Andrew, data is everything. We would like to offer the ease of service and keep the data. Is there anything out there? or otherwise for us to access? Yeah, I mean, um, this is getting itself promotional. <laughs> but this is, in fact, you look at the big part of our business <laughs> that we do, which is a great question. <laughs> anyway, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, please contact me. You can put you in touch with some of my folks. Look, all the guys back here are building uh, those types of uh, website that is not, you know, out of the box or can that it's, you know, tailored to a specific brand. And, and you know, part of the slingshot uh, is about trust too, right? Um, and we focus when we, you know, build those coding sites and consumer education site, we make sure, you know, all the design inspired trust. And part of being frictionless means trust. Uh, 
right? So if you have a lot of hoops to go to, you start losing trust uh, using uh, an electronic device or, or, a, or a web platform or whatever. And so, you know, we, we, we help our customers with that. So please contact me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since you did introduce the concept of trust, yeah. um, given that insurance is based on trust, the whole contractual obligation for both parties. Uh, so, so do we fundamentally believe that technology enhances that trust? And is it that consumers trust technology more than people? Uh, so I, I think it has to go together. Um, uh, actually, most of our staff here is trained in the concept called digital psychology. Um, and because we work, we're so connected and work with our devices so much, you know, we almost, you know, have the, you know, human desire to humanize, humanize it, right? And so it is possible to produce trust, you know, through your, through your computer. I'll give you an example. Amazon is the best at this, right? Um, one is it's so easy to buy one click, you know, that, that's trust. Um, they also, you know, provide, um, you know, urgency messaging uh, on their site. Like we can deliver this. If you have Prime, we'll deliver this to you tomorrow. Like that's trust. So how you communicate in digital um, and, and the experience you bring it through has a lot to do with the trust that you inspire. So if I have, you know, 10 pages that are really ugly uh, and clearly, you know, someone who developed it had, you know, put no thought into its uh, user experience. No, I would lose all trust, right? It's just like when you're shopping, you know, you go to one site versus another, you might not trust that site. And since you go to another, like you might go to back to Amazon and buy because you really trust their service and that, you know, they will deliver the products on time and so on. Yeah, insurance just doesn't work on the, your package will be there tomorrow. No, I mean, yeah, it doesn't. Right. I think I mean, it's the context, right? right? Yeah. If you ask yeah. that question, start with what's the context? And the context is unfortunately that, that, the degree of trust by particularly individual consumers and insurance is, is lower than it ought to be, right? Where exactly that lies is a matter of debate, but it's lower than where it ought to be. And, and so um, if you can deploy technology in a manner that increases trust, then I think, you know, I think you're delighting your customers, right? And, and that's what you want to do. And it's interesting because, because, um, a lot of the use cases around blockchain and artificial intelligence are, are, I think, are just for that at their core, right? How do you how do you implement a process that's going to result in the same decision over and over again, given the same inputs? And if that's the case, then people believe that their claim is being adjudicated fairly, and they believe that their insurance company isn't charging them more in auto rates than their neighbor. Or someone who lives in a different part of town, or whatever the case might be. And then we're about humanization that I brought up yeah. too. That's gonna make a big difference, right? Like uh, if you go through, um, you know, some of our consumer brand sites like Kinetics.ca, you'll see our phone numbers everywhere, and or a chat uh, or a chat uh, button. And we have people to make sure, like, as soon as someone calls, they're picked up. Like they, they have an S so they can't wait. They can't be waiting more than, you know, 15, 20 seconds for someone to answer the phone or, you know, longer than that for someone to respond on the chat. So that, that part of the connection will go a long way and inspire trust is how you treat and respond to, um, uh, to your customer's requests. I think it's a bit of a, brand, a branding exercise as well, because I agree there is sometimes an insurance a lack of trust across all parts of the service chain. But really, it is an industry that's based on trust. So on the life insurance side, I'm making a promise to you that maybe 30 to 40 years down the road, I'll help you with the price if something happens, right? So it, it is at its core, it's a trust-based industry, but we haven't branded it well. Like it, mm -hmm. Everybody will trust Google or Amazon or Apple way more than they would trust an insurance service, right? So we have to get that brand right as well. And just, it all goes down to everything you said, consumer experience, usability, simplicity, and just make sure that people realize that the promise that we have is an honorable purpose at insurance service. And sometimes I get lost along the way. Um, so we, we're doing really well here with questions. Um, in one of the, uh, so let's talk about uh, blockchain, if you would, uh, and smart contracts and, and the distributed ledger. So, uh, <laughs> and and if they are uh, obviously the intent would be that they would be useful in a commercial lines insurance space is the question. And then do you see cryptocurrencies and digital payment systems playing a role in this space in the future, which would enable business transactions? 
And if so, how will this take place? <laughs> don't, don't invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think blockchain, and again, I'm, I'm absolutely a, a early understander of blockchain, but from what I've seen and from what I understand, I think it will have a transformative effect. I don't know when. I think if you look at how um, how money moves as an example, when there's a big, there's a, there's a large cohort around the population of people who work in the area who send money back to family somewhere else, a Western Union type transaction, that's a very expensive transaction. Blockchain really looks for something like that because it, it takes those transaction fees down. And a smart contract, you're right. I think I, I read, I think it was EY did something with the shipping company, Merck, where they did a complete blockchain, a smart contract on a blockchain, and they had sensors on all the boats, so that are not all the ships. So the insurance would actually change depending where the ship was. So if it was going through maybe areas where pirates are more common, that coverage would suddenly come on as it, gets, as it comes into a bay, then suddenly that coverage would come on. So there are a lot of use cases happening, and I think it will be like a smart, a smart contract. Insurance that is close, some of the contracts aren't overly complicated. We make we put a lot of words around it, but they don't have to be that complicated. So I think it will have a very big impact. Um, I just, it, it's hard to say when. What would you guys say? I, I would agree. I mean, um, so, you know, uh, AIG in Canada is primarily still a commercial lines carrier. We think early adoption of blockchain in, in terms of smart contracts is, is perhaps a bit more consumer focused to start. Um, because to your point, I mean, you know, smart contract, it's a bit of a binary question. Did something happen or not? And if it did, then presumably there's a claim, valid claim and a payment's made. And if not, then the contract sort of ex self executes and that's the end of it. And, and a lot of what we ensure in the commercial space it's a little more complicated than that. You, you made some great examples, but marine, and there's more of them. And, and yeah, you know, it's interesting how it all intersects, right? Because that's all based on IoT and sensors and, and, um, and the networks that can actually reliably measure all of that and location and things. So I absolutely believe that it will filter into commercial. Um, I, I think, you know, really the dollar value is greater, the opportunity is greater in the commercial space than it is even in the consumer. So it will get there. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, smart contracts will absolutely enhance the trust proposition of insurance because there's no individual making the decision. It, it's an autonomous algorithm or program that decides whether the claim is valid or not. I do think travel insurance makes a lot of sense, right? Because there's, right. there's a lot of third-party oracles or places that you can go that will say, did a flight leave, yes or no? Mm -hmm. There's a trusted sites for that. So it will, it will creep in, in, in for sure, and we'll get into more complicated parts of our business in time. And then I, I mean, one thing I'd add is, you know, I think it will really take off, um, and of course, blockchain is different than, than cryptocurrency, but it, it, it will really take off if, and, and you know, some of the central banks are already talking about this, if they start to issue and manage digital currencies mm -hmm. themselves, right? So they are fiats, they are national currencies, but in electronic formats. Yeah. Um, and, and if you know, I think if you have that, then you're going to have widespread buy-in from the broad-based economy, and, and then you know, smart contracts really become valuable because not only they self-execute, but payment can be instantaneous as well. So I've uh, I've got different you know kind of take on it. I'm actually more interested in the crypto part okay. than the currency part, and I've seen you know some researchers uh, try to figure out whether uh, blockchain encryption could work over communications and for IoT to really secure them. For example, like the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications require autonomous cars and so on. So um, I'm, I'm seeing you know, that as an application. But I totally agree with you in terms of insurance. It would be for the commercial side, uh, more of the commercial side of things as a start. So as a segue, given all of this Internet of Things and all the data and all, one of the questions is, with all this heavy reliance on technology, data storage, all day-to-day -day transactions, of course, is what are the risks around hacking or crashing of systems due to natural disasters, cause temporary or complete disability of systems? What do we do in those kinds of cases when we rely so heavily on? Which are the insurers prepared for such risks and have plans for disaster management? Because that's a whole different level of disaster management. Absolutely. You're looking at me. <laughs> So obviously that's a big question. It's likely we don't have the exact answer for that, but there is obviously that my, that so I was my, my, my official response would be yes. <laughs> I, 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 you know, absolutely, absolutely it's a concern. Um, 
it's you know it's not being driven by insurance it's being driven by our society our society's new value most valuable asset is data and and whether insurance companies like it or not that's not going away um and and you know i, I can uh, I can just say, and I'm sure all insurance companies are similar and doing some exercises. You know, yes, we sell cyber insurance and 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 all kinds of products like that, and put a suite of services around it to try and help our insureds understand their risk and their vulnerabilities. But but what we do as an insurance company for ourselves is, you know, we're very much focused on risk aggregation and not just one insured getting hacked the systemic problems right and, and systemic failures um and and you know i think it's it's unfortunate it's more a question of, of when than if yeah. right yeah. um but but i don't think in some senses it's any different than when our our society and economy became relied lines on electricity and we have power grids and they're critical infrastructure and and well, they failed, right? We all lived through it a decade ago or so yeah. in the eastern seaboard, and the whole power grew down. And and the consequences are severe. This, the cyber part is, is something that I've been thinking a lot. You read a lot about because I, I agree, right? There's a there's a risk there for sure. And how do you keep on top of you buy a two hundred dollar printer connected to your internal Wi Fi, and how do you and then suddenly that becomes a, a window into your Wi Fi where you do all your banking? So it is something that certainly you hear at all. Conference, it's an interesting conversation, and it's a it's a win not win. But it's I don't know how we control it. That like is, have you seen like that security on a blockchain with that in that ledger? Yeah, the technology might be more interesting. But yeah, I've seen it uh, yeah. under development uh, in my work at the Rise and DMZ. So yeah. some of the startup companies are thinking about that and, and doing some prototypes. So it's really early days. But yeah, I agree. It's it's imminent. We all have to be very vigilant about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, and I think. We do rely heavily on our technology makers to make sure, you know, things are, uh, you know, they're uh, we're going to be protected. You know, our personal information, our data, our phones, etc. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we talk uh, talent for just a second? So one of the big, there's a couple of questions here that are related to talent. So one is um, a presumption that some of the roles in the industry will no, be no longer necessary if we enable technology to manage simple risks and the smart contracts simplify that and so like we're not going to need people uh, and some projections uh, are saying that it probably could be as much as 30 or 40 percent of the current workforce um, there's a question here about how long do you think the traditional book broker has until the industry and consumer expectations change so much that a broker is no longer either viable or necessary? Um, and you wanna, there's an aspect of, of humanity that you've brought into this conversation and the aspect of all the search and investigation and, and all of that still often um, has people wanting to confirm what they've learned or do the final purchase through a person. Yeah. So if that is true, then then the brokers still are necessary. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've always I've always personally believed in that that it is uh, that part is necessary. And survey after survey, and being a panel moderator, you know, and having millennials on the panel and stuff, they still yeah. say they don't, they don't trust you know buying some of these products online. You know, they're big ticket items, and I'd like to talk to someone. Yeah. But I think what we need to be aware around you know all of this technological change is that um, you know our roles and our jobs will be shifting to other things. Um, for example, um, you know our, our brokerage upstairs, we have more people that work online, purely online and chat versus the phone now, right? Like we, we switched the jobs like, okay, well, when you service your client, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be on chat and, and you're gonna update their app that has their policy you know, online instead of talking to them. So we, we start moving those. I've also heard lots of stories um, in the US where they're testing autonomous people. Truck drivers are moving their job from being a truck driver to being a truck drive tester. So they're testing the trucks, right? Um, and, and so they're switching their jobs to become uh, a, a trust driver. There's a drone company in the US called Better View and uh, they supply for insurance companies data on uh, properties for insurance and adjustment, right? And for adjusting. And uh, they, they use ex-military drone pilots 
They have a chief drone pilot officer where they will, uh, you know, they work the, the drones, but they will also teach the insurance company how to fly the drones. So you may not have an adjuster, but a drone pilot to do the adjusting, right? So that's, that's what's going to happen. I think you have to be aware that there's going to be a shifting in job. A lot of different than when horses became cars and so on. And all of a sudden, a lot of these workers, you know, people aren't, you know, uh, running uh, uh, stables for horses, but now they're paving roads and you know being happy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I, I agree with you that that no doubt um, at some of the lower level, more repetitive, simplistic tasks are going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. And it might not be the very same people that get repurposed to become our programmer and data analyst. But I, I get a sense that as an industry, I'm not sure our contribution to employment will, will change. Significant. I, I mean, I don't know that I have exact insight into that. I can tell you that we look at it as supplemental too, right? AI will be supplemental to our, our commercial underwriters. It will be a tool they use, not uh, you know a, a roadmap for replacing them. So in principle, there's there may be some roles that that may be phased so, out. There's most of the roles that are going to have a lot more technology applied to that. So whether it is the helping the customer update their app or understanding what the data tells them. Uh, and then there will be a whole bunch of other roles in terms of the data analysts and the, and the data scientists and all of those kinds of roles being brought into. And we're seeing that already. Yeah. I, I think of it as an opportunity, to be honest. It's yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so, so the question was about demand for talent in order to um, adapt to this new technology, the new data, uh, how to understand the data, extract insightful conclusions, uh, to be able to gain insight from that research. And so you can see that that's, that's a, a learning curve and, and uh, additional uh, training that would be required of, of staff. Probably not unlike at some point when we went from all paper to some level of computer, right? So, so I, it is a learning curve, but I also think, you know, I mean, in order to understand or to assess whether an insight is valuable, whether the insight will be truly valued by the customer, you have to some experience in that, right? So, so I want my 10, 20 year veterans who have been in the claims organization or have been underwriters still around because, you know, I, I think they have the greatest insights of all. Yeah, like it's hard to believe, but like when I started my insurance career, the, the, the internet, as crazy as it sounds, didn't exist. My kids don't have to understand to be able to Wi-Fi, never mind the internet. And as everybody started getting an email address, how crazy to think about an email address. And everybody said, you're only going to, after this, you're only going to work four days a week. Life will be great. The pace of change is going to keep happening. The advice is going to be important. The jobs absolutely will change and evolve. But I agree with Mark. There's going to be a big uh, job pool of that insurance company, insurance industry will continue to support.